Greece and Mesopotamia have been the meeting grounds for West and East for almost as long as history has been recorded. Given their constant interaction with each other, it should be no surprise that they shared many cultural aspects with one another. Sumerian influence on ancient Greece is seldom mentioned or analyzed in mainstream academia. While most of the current academic work involving Near Eastern influence on ancient Greece shows Hittite slash Hurrian and Akkadian slash Babylonian foundations, these civilizations certainly owe major parts of their cultural identity to the Sumerians and their pantheon of gods. Among the very earliest real glimpses that we have into Greek thought and life are the works attributed to the poets Hesiod and Homer. The Greek poet Hesiod is believed to have lived around 700 BCE, and the two major works attributed to him are the Works and Days and the Theogony. These works and the other early Greek poems attributed to Hesiod are major sources for information about Greek religion, mythology, agriculture, and timekeeping. Many of you viewing or listening know about the story of Prometheus and Pandora. If not, here is a super condensed summary. Prometheus had little love for the Olympians who had banished his fellow titans to the depths of Tartarus and his primary affection was for man. In retaliation, Zeus deprived man of fire, but Prometheus was not to be stopped. He stole it back and returned it to earth once again. As the price of fire and as punishment for humankind in general, Zeus created the woman Pandora and sent her down to Epimethus, who, though warned by Prometheus, married her. Pandora took the great lid off the jar she carried, and evils, hard work, and disease flew out to plague humanity. Hope alone remained within. Apparently, Zeus was so pissed with Prometheus because of the fire thing, he punished the Titan by having him taken far to the east to Caucasus. There, Prometheus was chained to a rock, and Zeus sent an eagle to eat the Titan's liver. Even worse, the liver regrew every night and the eagle returned each day to perpetually torment Prometheus. Fortunately for man's benefactor, but only after many ages, the hero Hercules, when passing one day during his celebrated labors, killed the eagle with one of his arrows. Before delving into this comparative analysis, the archive hastens to point out that these are potential connections between the gods and should not be interpreted as a definitive conclusion. In many cases, our analysis will include more than one possible counterpart for any given Greek or Sumerian god. Undoubtedly, some viewers may have researched comparisons which are not included in this treatment. The archive is simply presenting what it believes to be the strongest cases for comparison. So, with that said, let's dig deeper. Kronos is possibly the most famous of the Titans as he was the king and leader of his brothers fighting against Uranus and eventually the Olympian gods. Born of Uranus and Gaia, he was the youngest of their offspring and perhaps the most powerful. Kronos eventually gains power by overthrowing his father. He and his sister Rhea took the throne as king and queen and ruled during a golden age. Kronos would later lose his throne to his son, Zeus. The Greek god Kronos seems to compare well with the Mesopotamian god An or Anu, who belongs to the oldest generation of gods and was originally the supreme deity of the Babylonian pantheon. Consequently, his major roles are as an authority figure, decision maker, and progenitor. In heaven, he allots functions to other gods and can increase their status at will. In the Sumerian poem Inanna and Ibi, Inanna claims that An has made me terrifying throughout heaven. On earth he confers kingship and his decisions are regarded as unalterable. Later An, Anu, came to share or cede these functions as Enlil and subsequently Marduk rose to prominence, but he retained his essential character and high status throughout Mesopotamian history. There are no certain anthropomorphic representations of An or Anu. His symbol is a horned crown, sometimes shown resting on a throne. His animal is the bull. Zeus, also known as Jupiter, was the god of the sky and ruler of the Olympian gods. 
As mentioned earlier, he overthrew his father, Kronos, and then drew lots with his brothers Poseidon and Hades in order to decide who would succeed their father on the throne. Zeus won the draw and became the supreme ruler of the gods, as well as lord of the sky and rain. His weapon was a thunderbolt, which he hurled at those who displeased or defied him, especially liars and oath-breakers. Sometimes, Anu is argued to be Zeus's counterpart as supreme sky god and impartial ruler, but Anu was an antecedent god in Sumerio-Akkadian culture. Marduk is sometimes associated with Zeus as well. In Babylonian astrology, Marduk was connected to the planet known to us as Jupiter. As the ruler of the late Babylonian pantheon, he was later equated with the Greek god Zeus, the Greek equivalent for Jupiter. Thus, the planet was eventually given the name for the Roman deity who occupied Marduk's position. But, at the end of the day, the god Enlil seems to fit better as Zeus's counterpart as a punitive storm god, heir to Anu's throne on Nibiru, like Zeus to Kronos. Enlil was the god of the atmosphere and a member of the triad of gods completed by Anu and Enki. Although Anu was the highest god in the Sumerian pantheon, Enlil had a more important role as the embodiment of energy and force and authority. After Anu, Enlil was the most powerful of the Mesopotamian gods. He was keeper of the Tablets of Destiny, which contained the fates of gods and humanity, and much like Zeus, was considered an unstoppable force whose decisions could not be questioned. Poseidon, also known as Neptune, is the god of the sea and protector of all aquatic features. After the overthrow of Kronos, he drew lots with his brothers to share the universe. He ended up becoming lord of the sea. His weapon was a trident with which he could make the earth shake, causing earthquakes and shatter any object. He was second to Zeus in power amongst the gods. Enki seems to be Poseidon's most likely Sumerian counterpart. In Sumerian culture, Enki is heavily connected to the concepts of fertility and creation. This is often represented by water. Enki, however, is lord of all waters, both salt and sweet, that come from deep below the earth's surface. Ancient images of Enki show rivers flowing from his masculine shoulders. The rivers depicted are thought to be the Euphrates and Tigris rivers that flow through Mesopotamia and signify his gift of fertility to the land. Like Poseidon, Enki was a very powerful god and had the assistance of mystical beings at his service. Legends describe an assortment of creatures, such as mermaids, giants, and even demons that aided Enki in his earthly endeavors. Aphrodite, also known as Venus, is the daughter of Zeus and Dione in the Iliad, which prefers not to evoke the divine succession myth. Elsewhere, Aphrodite is born from the severed genitals of Uranus, which fall into the sea after Kronos castrates his father and takes his place. She is the goddess of beauty, sexual attraction, and generation in all living creatures. Ishtar, also known as Inanna, is Aphrodite's likely Babylonian counterpart. As goddess of both fertility, human, animal, and plant, and warfare, she is the highest ranking Babylonian goddess. Apollo is the son of Zeus and the goddess Leto. He is the god of the sun and patron of civilized arts associated with light, truth, prophecy, poetry, and the lyre. That is what today we would call classical music. He is the god of healing and, if angered, of sickness. In classical Greece and Rome, he becomes associated with hierarchy and the aristocracy. As god of sun, justice, morality, and truth, Shamash, also known as Utu, is Apollo's most obvious counterpart in Sumerio-Akkadian culture. Shamash, who was the brother of goddess Ishtar, is often pictured with a disc that symbolized the sun. Like the later Apollo, he made his daily journey through the heavens, either on horseback, in a chariot, or on a boat. Together with Sin and Ishtar, Shamash formed a triad of gods which completed the even older trinity of Anu, Enlil, and Enki, representing the heavens, earth, and water respectively. 
And just as Apollo has a twin sister, so does Shamash have a twin sister named Inanna. Hermes, also known as Mercury, is the son of Zeus and the minor goddess Maya. He is described as moving freely between the worlds of the mortal and divine. He is the boundary crosser, bringing messages from the gods to humans and escorting the souls of the dead to Hades. He is the patron god of heralds, travelers, and the lucky finders of buried treasure. Ningazita, also known as the Egyptian Thoth, has long been associated with Hermes. According to Zacharias Hitchin, Ningazita is the son of Inki and Irish Kigal, the Sumerian queen of the underworld. So, there seems to be a slight inconsistency if Inki's counterpart is Poseidon instead of Zeus, but this comparative analysis is focused on the deity's attributes, not so much on lineage. Despite the inky Enlil rivalry, however, Herm was highly regarded by all the factions in the sibling arc rivalry. In his Egyptian role as Thoth, Herm was the falcon among the gods, the god of the cord who measures the earth, the Anunnaki who was appointed to be guardian of the secrets of the great pyramids of Giza, as well as the god who replaced Horus, son of Isis, and Osiris on the throne of very, very ancient Egypt. There is the possibility Ningazita was also the early Mesoamerican god Quetzalcoatl. Hades, also known as Pluto, is the god of the underworld and was a son of the titans Kronos and Rhea. According to a single famous passage in the Iliad, Hades and his two brothers Poseidon and Zeus drew lots for realms to rule. And as mentioned earlier, Zeus received the sky, Poseidon received the seas, and Hades received the underworld, the unseen realm to which the souls of the dead go upon leaving the world, as well as any and all things beneath the earth. Hades' most likely Sumerio-Akkadian counterpart is Nergal. Nergal was the deity who presided over the netherworld and who stood at the head of the special pantheon assigned to the government of the dead. In this capacity, he has been associated with the goddess Irish Kigal. However, there is a significant inconsistency in the late Babylonian astro-theological system where Nergal is related to the planet Mars. As a fiery god of destruction and war, Nergal seemed an appropriate choice for the red planet, and he was equated by the Greeks to the war god Ares, hence the current name of the planet. Hades' wife was Persephone, and Irish Kigal is Persephone's most likely Sumerian counterpart as Queen of the Dead and ruler of the Netherworld. Before we close out, we'll cover a few more brief comparisons. Hera, also known as Juno, Queen of the Gods, is the goddess of marriage and legitimate rulers. Ironically, her own marriage was far from perfect and she was often angry at Zeus's infidelities. She aided the Greeks in their war against the Trojans partly because she was offended by the judgment of Paris and partly because Paris adulterated the marriage of a Greek king. One of Hera's most likely Sumerio-Akkadian counterparts is Ninkurzak. Demeter, also known as Ceres, is the goddess of agriculture. She is an extremely important goddess in Greek and Roman culture, but she does not play a large role in the epics of Homer or Virgil. Demeter's likely Sumerio-Akkadian counterpart is Ningal. Athena, also known as Minerva, daughter of Zeus, was normally the executor of Zeus's will. She was goddess of wisdom, victorious war, strategy, and the craft of weaving. Zeus swallowed Metis, whose name means craftiness or counsel, while she was pregnant with Athena. A few months later, Zeus had a dreadful headache and Athena sprang out in full armor. She carries Zeus's Aegis, a goat-skinned shield with gorgon head meant to terrify mortals with whom Zeus is angry. Like Hera, Athena's Sumerian-Akkadian counterpart could be Ninkurzag. Ares, also known as Mars, son of Zeus and Hera, is god of war. He delights in battle, in hacking with swords, piercing with spears, trampling with chariots, and burning with fire. He is not associated with victory or with stratagem, but merely with war per se. 
In Rome, he is a much more important god, second only to Jupiter, and he has agricultural as well as military associations. Ares has a few potential Sumerian-Akkadian counterparts. Ishkar, Ninurta, and as mentioned earlier, Ningal all have similarities with Ares. So, there you have some of the more prolific comparisons between the Greek and Sumerian pantheons of gods. Of course, there are potential different correlations than the ones presented. As such, feel free to post additional comparative analyses in the comments section.